Agreed, said. Amen. Amen. Last week I began speaking, uh, I called the message, Becoming the Habitation of the Lord. There's a difference between receiving Jesus as your Lord and Savior and Him receiving you as His habitation. To be born again, to call on the Lord for mercy, for your sins to be forgiven, the Spirit of Christ comes to live inside you. We receive Him. As many as received Him, He gave them power to become sons of God. That word means the authority. In other words, we have the potential. The sons of God there is uh, fully mature. We have the potential to become, grow up into the fullness of Christ when we receive Him. We become born into His family. Being born again is vastly different than becoming the habitation of the Lord. And uh, we saw that last week in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16, uh, through chapter 7, verse 1. It says, What agreement has a temple of God with idols? You are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will dwell in them, I will walk in them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, now he's speaking to believers, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is a promise made to believers who are born again, and the Spirit of Christ is in them, but they have not yet become the habitation. There's a difference between the Spirit of Christ dwelling in you and God taking up full residence in you. That's why he's writing to believers in 2 Corinthians 16. God has promised you, I will dwell in your midst, I will walk among you, I will be your God, you'll be my people, therefore... Come out from among them. Be separate. Touch not the unclean thing, and I'll receive you. Now God says He will receive us, but there's a condition. We have to come out, be separate, and touch not what's unclean. Then He says, I'll receive you. Receive us for what? Now Paul is writing to people who've already received the Lord. They're born again. But now he's saying, if you want to become the habitation of the Lord, he ha you have to qualify for Him to receive you, not to be saved from hell, not to be born again, for Him to receive you as His habitation. That's what the Scripture says. There's a vast difference. So we, we are not called merely to be born again and miss hell. We were created to be the habitation of God. No human heart will ever be satisfied until we get fuller and fuller and fuller with the Holy Spirit. We were created to be the habitation of God. So we want to discover what does that look like? How do we pursue it? And he says, after he gives them the promise, he says, therefore then, having this promise, beloved, cleanse, let's cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of flesh and spirit, and perfect holiness, the word perfect means bring to maturity. Bring to maturity holiness in the fear of God. Hebrews 12, verse 14, again, Paul is writing to believers. These are believers who are born again. He's writing to them. He says to them, pursue peace with all people. Now, we can't make other people be at peace with us, but we can pursue peace. If we've done something wrong to someone, we should go to them and ask for forgiveness. And if they don't forgive you, that's up to them. But we're to do our part. Amen. So he said, pursue peace with all men. If I pursue peace with everybody, but some people won't be at peace with me, I'm right in God's eyes. I'm still justified in God's eyes because I pursued peace. That's what each one of us needs to do is do our part. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So there's the two things if we want to see the Lord. See, he's not talking about being saved. He's writing to saved people. 
He said, if we want to see the Lord, if we want to be his habitation, these things are required. I must pursue peace and I must pursue holiness. Holiness is required if we're going to be his habitation. Now, we covered that last week. Just quickly, let me do a little bit of uh, review. Last week, we looked at Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. God spoke to Moses. He said, speak to the children of Israel that they bring me an offering from everyone who gives it willingly with his heart. You shall take my offering. So God's not interested in compulsion. He's not interested in us doing something out of obligation, out of duty, but he wants something to come willingly from our heart. Amen. Amen. So he said an offering. Now this offering is required for habitation. Watch. He said, this is an offering you should take from them. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen. And he goes on. All of them are precious, valuable things. God said, I want this, but I want it to come freely from everyone who wants to do it. So God's not forcing anybody. Verse 8, and he says, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. It has always been God's heart to want to dwell in and among his people in fullness. So God said, so now they're God's people, but God says, I want to dwell among them. Now the Old Testament, we're told in Hebrews, is types and shadows of the reality in Christ. So for God's habitation, the fullness of his presence, God says, here's what it will require. An offering that costs you something, but I want it, God's saying, I want you to do it because you want to, not out of obligation. Because you want a sanctuary. Because you want God's presence. Because you want to willingly. And if you want to, bring God an offering. Uh, now, parallel in the New Testament, we're told in Romans chapter 12 that we're to offer our body as a living sacrifice. We're to say, here I am, Lord. Amen. Amen. He says in Romans 12, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. Our bodies should be presented to the Lord as holy and acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. Now in Exodus 40, after the sanctuary was built, as Moses obeyed God and all the people brought the offerings, it says in verse 32 of Exodus 40, whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting, and when they came near the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded them. Now, what we're looking at is how do we become the, the dwelling place of God? Is there anybody here? And I know you are. You wouldn't be here. Wants more of God's presence in your life. Wants a closer walk with God in your life. So we can understand. If we know what God wants, we can give it to him. Here's what God says. God says, I want to dwell in you. I want to walk among you. So therefore, God says, I will be your God. You'll be my sons and daughters. Here's what I want you to do, God says. Come out from among them. Be separate. Don't touch what's unclean. The psalmist says, I'll put no wicked thing before my eyes. Watch out what our, we see on media. Guard your ears from foul talk, immorality, gossip, slander, backbiting, bitterness, unforgiveness. Keep your ears from it. It defiles you. Hebrews tells us the root of bitterness defiles many. Criticalness. So he said, come out, be separate, don't touch it, and I'll receive you. What do, we, what do we get when he receives us? We get more of him. That which we were created for. So God, so Moses builds a sanctuary. God comes in the sanctuary in his glory. Verse 34 of Exodus 40 says, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. So in the type and shadow, a visible, tangible cloud of God's presence filled the tabernacle because it was built according to the way God said. 
Now here's what God said. Whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting, when they came near the altar, they washed as the Lord had commanded them. Now Peter tells us that we are the living stones being built up into a spiritual house. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2 that we are being built, we're in the process, if we allow the Lord to work in us. If we understand what He's building us into and we pursue it and cooperate, then He can do it. That's why we need to know the will of the Lord. Ephesians chapter 2 says you are being built together into a holy dwelling place. If we don't go to church, we can't be built together into a habitation. If we go to church twice a month, we can't be built together into a holy dwelling place. He said, you are being built together into a holy dwelling place of God. Chapter 2, that's Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul gives the prayer for that dwelling place. He said, for this reason, I bow my knees and he prays. What's his prayer? That we would all be rooted and grounded in love. That's his prayer in a nutshell. He goes more. He'd be able to comprehend the length and breadth and depth and height of the love of Christ that passes knowledge so that we can all be filled, watch, with all the fullness of God. He's writing to believers who Christ lives in them, yet they're not yet built into a habitation and they're not yet filled with the fullness of God. So God's plan is to have a people on the earth that allow themselves to be built together into a holy, H-O-L-Y. Holiness needs to come back to the church as a norm. Yeah. 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 Holiness is beautiful. It literally is beautiful. Holiness literally makes someone look beautiful. It does make you look beautiful. And there's an inner beauty of holiness that far surpasses anything in the physical realm. I told you this more than once. There was, she's gone on to be with the glory, uh, with the Lord in glory now. And, and I can't even remember her name. If Jack and Grace were here, they could help me remember her. But she was a missionary to South Africa. And um, she used to come to Lancaster in the 80s. And um, for some reason, I can't remember her name. Maybe that's, maybe I'm supposed to not remember her name. She was very large, probably five foot six, probably 300 plus pounds. Had a very large nose, very large, homely face, very, very overweight. One of the most attractive people I've ever met. Full of the Holy Spirit and love. She used to minister here in Lancaster in the 80s. In the net, she was so full of the Holy Spirit and so full of love. She prophesied over my son Elijah when he was six months old. She's so full of the Holy Spirit, you didn't even register what she looked like in the natural. You didn't even see it. We are too earthly minded. These outer bodies are but for a moment. It says our outer man is perishing. Our inward man is renewed day by day. Have you ever been around somebody that's so full of the love of God? It doesn't matter what they look like. Who cares? Christ is in them. See, the beauty of holiness, when the beauty of holiness is on someone, Christ is manifested. That's what we're called to. Every one of us. Christ is in us, but what God wants out of us is that somehow we would cooperate with the dealings of the Holy Spirit. We would yield to the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and allow Christ to form us and build us into his dwelling place where he's manifesting in his fullness. 
That's exactly what the Scripture says. If it wasn't in the Bible, I'd have a hard time believing it. But Paul, after he tells us that we are to be built together, now, now there are individuals that carry the beauty of holiness, but God's plan is that He builds us together to love one another in humility, in gentleness, in long-suffering, bearing with one another, that we would be a holy dwelling place where the beauty of holiness rests upon a people. Where we become corporately the habitation of God. And God said in Ephesians 2, His plan is to build us together into that. Where God dwells in our midst. Where God walks among us. Where His fullness is manifested. Where in that atmosphere, nobody's thinking about the preacher or the singer. But the eyes are on the beauty of the Lord. See, we were created to be His dwelling place. We have the highest calling of any of God's creation. We do. We have the highest calling of any of God's creation to be His habitation. And God said, if you'll come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing, I'll receive you. And in context, He says, I'll receive you as my habitation. Therefore, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all filthiness of flesh and spirit and perfect holiness in the fear of God. So he says, so in the Old Testament tabernacle where the glory cloud came, it says in Exodus 40, verse 32, whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting, whenever they came near to the altar, they washed as the Lord commanded, had commanded Moses. That speaks of the washing of, of the water of the word, the laver that was in the temple, and the water that speaks of before we can come into the manifestation of his presence, we apply the word of God. We wash ourselves in the water of the word. This has to become a daily habit. We should wash in the water of the word more often than we take a shower. It's the truth. There's power in the Word. There's power in the Word. There's power in the Word to sanctify us. There is power. The entrance of His Word brings light. Psalm, the psalmist says, Thy Word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. If I want to overcome sin, I should take the Word of God and meditate it and store it in my heart. That Word becomes a stronghold of light inside me, empowering me, giving me victory over sin. That's what the Bible says. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 17, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. In Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says that Jesus Christ gave himself for the church. He loved the church, gave himself for her that he might wash her with water by the word, that he might present her to himself glorious without spot or wrinkle. Jesus, if we neglect spending time in the word, then we are prohibiting God from doing in us what Jesus died for us on the cross. He died for us. He gave himself so that he could wash us. And so if we want to become His habitation, uh, being washed in the water of the Word must be cultivated as a lifestyle. The Word must be our life. The Word must be our daily bread. The Word must be our guide. The Word must be the light to our feet and the lamp to our path. The Word sanctifies us. Come on, I want to be a habitation. Now it said, whenever they approached the sanctuary, they would wash themselves first. What would happen if every time believers met, before we met, I know what would happen, before we met in a home group, before we met on Sunday, before we met in a prayer meeting, we spent an hour with the Lord. Before we met. I'll tell you what would happen. 
If we, here's what they did. They washed himself in the word. What would happen if before we met for the home meetings, before we met for the prayer meetings, before we met for Sunday, people were at home on their knees, worshiping God, praying, repenting. We all need to repent every day. Every day we need to repent of something. Something we thought, said, or did, or didn't do. And then spend some time reading and meditating on the Word. Praying the Word. What would happen? What that's called is washing yourself. That's washing yourself. Now in the Old Testament, here's how they came in. They had to physically wash. But that's a type and a shadow of the reality in Christ. So we can continue to do what Americans have done for decades in tradition, don't wash ourselves, neglect the word most of the... I'm not trying to scold anybody. I'm just giving you a real appraisal of the real situation. Neglect the word five out of seven days. Busy. Crack your Bible for a second. Run out the door. What are we in the Spirit? We're unwashed. We're unwashed. We come together in the spirit. We stink. We've got B.O. We've got dirt on us. Our garments are soiled. Doesn't mean you're not loved. Please hear me. Doesn't mean you're not loved unto death. Doesn't mean you're not the darling of God's heart. It means he can't come in fullness. I want fullness. Our city needs fullness in the church. Here's what happens when fullness comes. Turn to Mark chapter 1. We have the privilege of becoming the dwelling place of God. What? I love that, Exodus 40, 32. Whenever they went into the tabernacle of meeting, they washed as the Lord had commanded Moses. I want to challenge everyone here to go deeper in the Lord by spending more time alone with the Lord in the Word and in prayer. You will never regret it. I want to promise you this. I, I guarantee this. I promise you this. No one not one person ever got to heaven and said, darn, I, I spent too much time in the Word. I wish I would have played more video games. No one ever got to heaven and said, I wasted so much time praying and seeking God. No one ever did. But I guarantee you, I guarantee you the vast majority of Christians, when the veils are taken away, and they see where they really are and where they could have been. Weep deep tears of regret. Say, my God, why did I waste so much time running around, going my friends, doing this? To, why didn't I take the time every day to feed on the Word of God, which has the power to sanctify me? It has the power to give me victory over sin. I'm not going to say it'll happen by Monday, but if you stay in the Word, progressively you'll get victory. Amen. You might get victory by Monday, but it might be 10 Mondays from now. But if you stay in the Word, the Word has the power to sanctify you. Jesus said in John chapter 8, those that continue in my Word are my disciples, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So they would wash themselves in the water of the Word. And then when they did that, God's presence would come. I want to challenge everybody. Let's not be hearers only. Let's not say amen, amen and not do it. Let's all go deeper in our personal devotional life with the Lord. Let's make it our prayer, God, I personally want to become your dwelling place. And I want to be part of, 
other living stones that you build together into your habitation. I want that. In this life, on this earth, in this decade. Amen. God said in Ephesians 2, you're being built together into his habitation. In Ephesians 3, he prays for that. He said, for this reason, and then he prays it will be rooted and grounded in love. In other words, the love of Christ is much bigger than being nice to each other. We should be nice to each other. That's part of the love of God. Love is not rude. But being nice is not only the love of God. 1 John 3, 16 defines the love of God. Here is how, it says, here is how we know what love is. He laid down his life. We also ought to lay down our lives. Love is defined, lay down my life. Now, we can only do that as the Holy Spirit empowers us. But he's in us. We can do it. So we pray. We make love our goal. 1 Corinthians 14, 1, pursue love. Lord, help me grow in love. Help me love my wife better. Help me love my kids better. Help me love my neighbor better. Help me love the congregation better. Help me love my fellow workers better. Here's what John says, 1 John 4, 12. He said, no one's seen God at any time, but if we love one another, God abides in us. And his love has been made perfect in us. Now listen, for love to be made perfect in you or me, I don't need to go to Tibet. Please hear this. I don't have to go far away. I don't have to have a big, awesome ministry. I don't have to have signs, wonders. We want signs and wonders, all that. So I'm not against signs and wonders. I don't have to move in all the gifts. If I want love to be made perfect in me, I have to love the person next to me. Amen. Love my brother. Amen. Love my sister. Love my neighbor. Love my cousin. Love my aunt. Here's what it says, 1 John 4, 12. If we love one another, his love is made perfect. Please hear this. God has so designed our lives, all of us, that our own brother or sister, father, mother, neighbor, person next to us, is tough enough for us to love at times that it will require that we grow up into the perfection of Christ to do it. It's possible to go to Tibet or Timbuktu and do something great for God and not grow up in love. God's more impressed how I treat my wife than how far I fly and preach to a crowd. So the love of God, learning how to love. So Ephesians 3 is the prayer to become the habitation is to grow in love. Ephesians 4 is the exhortation. To walk worthy of that calling. Ephesians 4, he said, Therefore I beseech you, brethren, to walk worthy of this calling. What calling is he talking about? The calling to be the dwelling place of God, where God comes in fullness, is in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I exhort you to walk worthy of this calling, bearing with one another in gentleness, humility, long suffering, bearing with one another in love keeping, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Holy Spirit. That's how we walk worthy. So, we, so, so how do we put it together? We say, God, I want to be your habitation. I want the fullness of God in my life. All right, I'm going to pursue holiness. I want, the, I want fullness of God in my life. I'm going to pursue peace with all men. As uncomfortable as it may be, pursue it anyway. You may not be successful because it takes two to be at peace. But do your part and pursue holiness. And then grow in love. In other words, with those that were, God's put us together. Let's pursue. None of us always do it perfect all the time. That's why we need grace with each other. So we need forgiveness, long suffering, long suffering. That's what it means in the Greek. It means long suffering. 
bearing with one another. Now listen, that's what love does. So we, gentleness, long-suffering, bearing with one another. And the goal, he says, is endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's habitation. Now let's go on. That was my uh, review of last week. Now, for this week's message, there's some more. What God says about, uh, listen, we all Christians, all congregations, all over the world, are called by God to become the habitation of His fullness. We need to recover that. I was going to say, I was going to show you what happens when we have habitation. Look at Mark chapter 1. Verse 29, now as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, this is Jesus, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Then Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand, lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she served them. I remember Jesus walked into Simon Peter's house. What's the first thing he did? Healed. When Jesus is manifesting in the house, he heals. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. Look at verse 33. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. We are called to be his house. We are called to have his fullness. When the fullness of God starts to fill the church, the whole city will gather at the door. The whole city will gather at the door when they know God is in the house. Amen. Not the famous preacher that may last for a week or two when they blow into town. Uh, and I don't mean to be disrespectful. Let me say not, not say blow into town. There's legitimate people that carry anointings and giftings. They come in. There's a surge for a while. They leave. It's gone. It's different when Jesus is in the house. It's different than a gifting and anointing, which we admire, we, ex we respect, we honor all the giftings of the Holy Spirit and the anointing. It's different than habitation. Habitation, when Jesus is in the house, the whole city will gather at the door. I've seen it in a vision. Now, go to Mark chapter 2. We'll see it again. Peter tells us that we are his house. Mark chapter 2, verse 1. And again, he, Jesus, entered Capernaum after many days. And it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no longer room to receive them, nor even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him bringing a paralytic. You know the rest of the story. They brought the paralytic and the man was healed. When Jesus enters into his own house, which we are, when the fullness of the Lord comes into the house, there's not enough room to get the people in. I call it presence evangelism. Now, how, how do we go toward that? How do we go toward that? That's what was happening in the book of Acts. When the presence of God is in the midst of the people in a mighty way, the Lord is dwelling in the midst of His people, they gather seven days a week. That's what it says, every day they gathered. No one will gather seven days a week. There's nobody, there's no human magnetism that can make people come seven days a week. There's no guilt trips, no conniving, nothing that you can make people come seven days a week. You might get them to do it for one week. After that, everybody's tired. But when God's in the house, people are fighting to get in there seven days a week. See, the day will come when the fullness of God comes in the house where 
Sometimes husbands and wives have to take turns watching little kids. They'll say, but you went to church last night. It's my turn. Why? Because we were created for him. Now, how can we become his dwelling place? 1 John 4.12. If we love one another, God dwells in us. So growing in love, that goes with Ephesians 3. Growing in love. We need to make pursuing love our goal. Anything I think, say, or do outside of the love of God is not the will of God. Now watch this, 1 John 3, 24. Here's another one. Jesus said, he who keeps his commandments, I'm John the Beloved wrote this, I mean, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. Keeping the commandments of Jesus. The dwelling place of God will be people who keep the commandments of Jesus. John writes, John the Beloved says, and this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. It means we can do it. Christ is in us. We can forgive. We can love. We can go the second mile. We can turn the other cheek. We can get over our offense. We can do it. We can love one another. We can keep his commandments. We can come out and be separate. We can touch not what's unclean. We can walk the straight and narrow highway of the beauty of holiness. We can do it. Christ is in us. The love, it said, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Love is not an emotion. It's a response from the heart of obedience to God. That's our love. It says, this is the love of God. It may include our emotions. It may or may not. There are times I don't feel emotional about serving God. I may wake up with a headache. I may wake up tired, but I still love him. And I still get up and I get on my knees and start my day like I do every day. On my knees, lifting my hands, thanking God. Whether I feel like it or not. Because love is a choice. This is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. We can do it. Here's what Jesus said in John 14, verse 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. I will love him and manifest myself to him. Now, there were two Judases. So one Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? So now in verse 23, Jesus is going to interpret for us verse 21. Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Now, God making his abode with us is different than being born again. You can be born again and not keep his commandments. But to be born again and keep his commandments, God said, I'm going to come make my home with you. That's fullness. That brings us to, I'm going to try to conclude this message. We're talking about becoming the dwelling place of God. Understanding that we were created for him. We were created to be his dwelling place. God will dwell in the midst of holiness. He'll dwell in the midst of love. He'll dwell in the midst of obedience to his commandments. It's not hard, John said. It's not burdensome. John said, we can do it. Isn't that encouraging? We can do this. Come on, we can love one another. We can forgive. We can get over our big issues. You know what I mean, our big deals. Like when we're offended or upset, at the time it seems like a big deal. But if we hold our breath and wait two or three days, it's not such a big deal. 
right? We can love each other. If we're going to if we're going to become his dwelling place, that means obedience to his commandments becomes part of our lifestyle. To me, that translates that any disobedience is disqualifying me. Any willful disobedience is disqualifying me from habitation. I'm not saying there's no forgiveness or no place of repentance, but I don't want disobedience in my life. Here's what Jesus said when he was only 12 years old, when his parents were looking for him at the census, and they lost him. And they finally found him in the temple, talking with the teachers and the scribes. He said, where were you, son? We were worried about you. He said, why did you seek me? Listen to this. He's 12 years old. Didn't you know I must be about my father's business? Jesus came into the earth as an example for us. But 1 Peter chapter 2 said, it says, he's an example that we should follow in his steps. At 12 years old, he, she already knew why he was here. I'm here to do my father's business. We are blood bought. We are not our own. We belong to Jesus. If we understand I am here not for my pleasure, not for my dream, not for my whatever, I'm here for my father's business. It'll help us obey. Jesus said in John 4, 34, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. That was his sustenance. Jesus, now what do we get when we eat food? We get nutrients. We get energy. We get strength. We get rebuilt. Right? Jesus said... I get energy, strength, and I get rebuilt by doing the will of the Father. He said, my food is to do the will of Him and finish His work. Let's have that mindset. What is Jesus, what am I, why am I saying this about Jesus? Because He was the walking dwelling place of God. The Bible says all the fullness of the God had dwelt in Jesus bodily. He's our example of habitation. So we're going after habitation. If you're, not, if you're not hungry for habitation, you're in the wrong church. It will just irk you. Here's another one, John 6, 38. I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Don't you love that? Hebrews 10, verse 7, it says of Jesus. Behold, I have come, in the volume of the book it's written of me, to do your will, O God. I like this. I'm almost done. John 8, 29. Jesus said, He who sent me, the Father, is with me. And the Father has not left me alone, for I always do the things that please him. Now, Jesus has the greatest relationship with the Father. How many agree with that? Jesus is not seeking his own glory. He says, I'm seeking the, I'm here to do the will of him who sent me. I seek the glory of him who sent me. He's not seeking his own glory. I came to do the Father's will. The Father never leaves me because I always do what pleases him. And the Father then is watching out for Jesus. The Father glorifies the Son. The Father has given all judgment to the Son. The Father's given all authority to the Son. He's given all things to the Son. The Son says, I do my dad's business. The Father said, I take care of the Son. So Jesus calls us into the same relationship with God, that we would become, just as Jesus was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, we are called to the same thing, corporately. Here's what Jesus said. In John 17, I do not pray for these alone, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word. Verse 21, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I is in you. So there's our license. There's our calling. Jesus said, the same relationship I have with my Father, where I come into the world and I come in to do his will. 
I seek to only do the things that will always please Him. And the Father in turn provides for me, anoints me, fills me, guides me, and gives me all authority and all power, and everything is, is mine. And I focus on glorifying Him, and He glorifies me. Jesus said, Father, I pray that they would be one in us, just like you and I are one. He calls us into the same relationship, where we say, God, I've come to do your will. I want to always do your will. I want to always do what pleases you. God said, I'll always meet your needs. I'll always protect you. I'll anoint you. I'll make you my habitation. I'll fill you with my fullness. He never said, I have come into the world that those in darkness could go to church once a week. <clears throat> to come into union with Jesus, to become his habitation, is to overcome. That's what it means to overcome. That's what Jesus said. To him who overcomes, I'll give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2.26, whoever overcomes and keeps my works to the end, I'll give him power over the nations. See, the Father gave Jesus everything. We're called into the same relationship. Revelation 3.12, to him who overcomes, I'll make a pillar in the temple of God. He'll go out no more. I'll write on him the name of my God. Name means character and nature. God said, I will impart my character and my nature into you. Revelation 3.21, to him who overcomes, I'll grant to sit with me on my throne. Just as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Jesus is calling us into the same relationship with the father as he has. Revelation 21.7, he who overcomes shall inherit all things and I will be his God. He shall be my son. John 16, verse 15, Jesus said, All things that the Father has are mine. Jesus said that. All things that the Father has are mine. Now here's what it says to us. The word says to us, Whoever overcomes shall inherit all things. I will be his God. He shall be my son or daughter. That's habitation. We forfeit habitation by compromise. We can be saved. We can even be anointed, even be used by God. We can even have a ministry. But we forfeit habitation by compromise. Lord, make us your dwelling place. God can sanctify us. He can wash us with his word. If we'll give ourselves to it. We can love each other. Can't we? We can be long-suffering. We can bear with one another to keep the unity of the Spirit. Can we? Can we wash ourselves like they did before they went to the sanctuary? Can we wash ourselves before we come together? What would happen if we do? I don't know if you remember, it was probably about three years ago. I exhorted our body to do just that. You remember about three years ago, I told everybody what it says in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. It said all the priests sanctified themselves before they came together. So about three years ago, I exhorted our body and I said, listen, we are called to be the dwelling place of God. Everybody, a lot of people get up, you know, I think of that old Beatles song. Remember it? Woke up, fell out of bed. I dragged a comb across my head. Looking up, I noticed I was late. <laughs> you know, made the bus in seconds flat. That's how people come to church. Ha! <laughs> I got in. Whoo! <laughs> Praise God. I hope, every, hope the worship team's anointed today. <laughs> no, you're supposed to bring oil. You 
Remember that Beatles song? It's a, it's a weird song, but anyway. <clears throat> Listen, so I exhorted everybody. It says in Second Chronicles, all the priests sanctified themselves first. Then they came together to worship. And when they did, their worship was in one accord. Unity comes as a result of corporate holiness. So they sanctified themselves. Then when they came together and began to praise the Lord, it said the glory filled the place. And nobody could minister. Now watch. So I exhorted everybody. I said, next week, spend an hour or a chunk of time. I don't think I said an hour. Spend some time alone with the Lord. Sanctify yourself. Pray. Get in the Word. Get full of the Holy Spirit. Then come together corporately to bless the Lord after you've sanctified yourself. And let's see what happens. Well, you know what happened the next Sunday? First of all, I was pleasantly surprised. 90 plus percent of everybody was here on time. That never happens. Uh, this is the truth. You remember it? Anybody remember it? I, 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 right at 10 o'clock, the place was almost full. I'm like, I can't believe this. I'm supposed to believe, you know? And I... <laughs> It's full. Watch. Worship starts, and whoa, the anointing fills the place. We worship for an hour, and we can't stop. It's too anointed. I'm thinking this will be a sin if I would preach right now. So we, we get into this quiet place of, of just, oh. And then somebody, I think it was Rachel, gave a word. Repent! And I remember thinking, oh, Lord, is that you? It was such a sweet anointing. And the sharp word came. I said, Lord, is that you? He said, yes, it is. Give an altar call. So I just told Gene, keep playing. I gave an altar call. Listen, that Sunday we had about 20 visitors. All of them came forward. You remember it? They all came forward. As soon as they came forward, I said, just keep on praising we laid hands on them. Some of them got instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of them hit the floor and started speaking in tongues. Other people instantly healed. Another person, a demon came out. Healed, saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, delivered. While worship just went another hour. I never preached. Everybody went home full of the Holy Spirit. What is that? That's, that's just approaching habitation. And how many remember that? That day? Yeah, we just praised God for about an hour, then had an altar call. People saved, healed, filled with the Holy Spirit, then praised Him for another, I think, 45 minutes. And, and, to, and then everybody's like, we're all just like, and, and nobody ministered. Now, I believe that's only the beginning of the beginning of the beginning putting our toe in the water. We need to pursue habitation. That's my message for today. Help us, Lord. Lord, help us. Lord, we need your grace. Lord, sanctify us. Wash us with your living rhema word. Draw us, Lord. Lord, I pray that hunger for you, hunger for your will, would eclipse anything that has entangled us or tried to be a weight or hold us back. Lord, I pray that we will be those who run the race, shaking off every weight and sin which so easily besets us. We would be those that run with endurance in the name of Jesus. Lord, build us. Are you in agreement with me? Lord, build us into a holy dwelling place. Build us into a house of prayer. Let the Antelope Valley be shaken by the power of God. Lord, we want you to come into this house and let the city gather at the door. 
in the name of Jesus. And all that agreed said,